our businesses give us a idea generation machine, a group of people on hand whose job it is to take your vision and turn them into cash flows. We stand today. The Business Method. The business with method. a shadow. The Business Method. The Business Method Podcast. The Business Method Podcast featuring Chris Reynolds. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics for location independence. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, people of all ages, welcome to the Business Method Podcast, where we examine the different methods, tools, and tactics of high-performance online entrepreneurs and high-caliber people in a series format. Our first series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs in 100 days that had built businesses creating $100,000 or more annually. On our second series, we are interviewing 100 entrepreneurs that have built location-independent businesses that generate a million dollars or more in annual revenue. There is a growing movement of people building these caliber of businesses, and we wanted to get behind the minds, the logic, and the science of what it takes to build a business like this. We've had some incredible guests like Bobby Edwards, the founder of Squatty Potty, who built a $35 million per year company with just 17 employees, and J.P. Sears, the YouTube superstar whose videos are going viral all over the internet. I'm your host, Chris Reynolds, and we hope you enjoy the show. The Business Method. Hey, listeners, and welcome back to the show. Our last episode, we featured Dan Andrews, and we got so much valuable content that we decided to break it up into two amazing podcast episodes. So this show is an extension of the first one. If you haven't heard the first one yet, be sure to check that one out. If you have, welcome back, you guys, and we're going to dive deeper into learning about exiting a business and the important things one should measure before making the exit. Dan has some amazing gold nuggets on this subject, and I think anybody that's considering exiting should check this one out for sure. Now, let's jump back into the show. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics for location independence. And correct me if I'm wrong, just for the listeners, Dan's business was a, um, you were the number one val- uh, seller of valets in the United States. Is that correct? Valet parking podiums. Yeah. Parking podiums. And you also sold cat furniture too. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Are those, those were part of the same business? They were part of the same business, which is essentially a business that identified underserved, ideally B2B niches. So we had another niche of portable cocktail bars and we would figure out these underserved niches and we would, uh, custom design products Mm -hmm. to serve that market and then use you know, and a marketing team that was global and location independent to, uh, to sell the products. Say you went back to yourself four years ago, four and a half years ago, who was considering you and your partner considering selling this business? What would you tell them? What were some of the, besides don't do it, what are some of the yeah. things you would tell them to the steps to take to keep, to get rid of the problems that you had and keep a balance in that business to where today you can say, Oh, I'm really, really, really excited and happy that I kept the business. Well, great question, Chris. I'm glad you asked me because I wrote a book about this topic. (laughs) Well, okay. The, the, that conversation is complex, but what's, what's more simple and more fun might be, I would ask them five questions and I would say, here are five thought experiments that I want you guys to fly to a location and before you you know, take on a four-year project and commit to a life-changing thing and all this, let's make sure we're asking some of the core questions at play here. Let's make sure we're doing it you know, fully intentionally. And you know, we just sort of, we didn't have that, an engagement in this project in the in the same like full on intellectual engaged way that we did when we started the business. We just thought, you know, hey, let's just get our money out of this thing and move on to the next thing. Clear up some mental RAM and focus on some of these projects that we've been, you know, sort of wanting to do but we're too busy or too many responsibilities or whatever, right? So, let's get clear on why we're doing this and what we want to do. So, is it okay if I walk you through the five questions just to talk about some of them? Yeah, of course, of course. Okay, so if I'm sitting across the table from Dan and Ian before this, the first question I would have asked 
is what's the next level on your lifestyle ladder? Um, And this is a concept that was not intuitive. It might have been intuitive to me, but it wasn't clear to me at the time. Like I just thought basically that more money was a sort of an inherently a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but money doesn't behave linearly. So here's what I mean by that. I'll tell you my lifestyle ladder right now, which is like the level of personal cash in my bank account that makes a sort of a meaningful difference in my life. So the first is being in debt. That is obviously a position that you don't want to be in. So you want to get from debt to broke, which is zero money, you know, (laughs) as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. The next level for me then was, let me uh, consult the book here. (laughs) Uh, Basic savings. So basic savings was having 20 to 40 K in my personal bank account. That's a, a, like sort of a whole nother level of financial freedom, mm-hmm. you know, from having zero and using your credit cards to sort of put gas in your tank and all that. I remember that. I remember like not being able to use my debit card to get gas because it was towards the end of the paycheck. <laughs> I had a credit card. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. So here's the thing about having like, say you've got, um, you, you did have zero money, then you got 20 grand from your business. Mm-hmm. Now, if someone comes along and offers you a really good deal for your business, so if you read all these business books, they'll tell you about how to like maximize the deal, how to get a good deal, how to negotiate, all these sorts of things. And for you, you would get $20,000 for that business. Mm-hmm. And so then you would have 40K in your bank account. That's probably not going to make any meaningful difference in your life. Right. So the idea here is like, why would you give up on this like sort of poker chip that you have at the table in order for like no meaningful difference? Now, so this is why, you know, incremental $20,000 don't behave linearly. Like the first $20,000 was really important. The next $20,000 doesn't make a difference. Um, do you see what I mean about the linearity here? Yeah, yeah. So, so if I'm just giving myself as an example, Chris, and if you want to share your stuff, that would be kind of interesting too. Mine was like having six figures in the bank, and that's the level that I call financial platform. And basically, if I'm going to skip to the punchline, because I think every listener should do this exercise for their own thing. Don't listen to what I'm doing. You know, this is your own life, your own family. You have to figure out what to do for yourself. For me, what I found was that having that financial platform, which is six figures in savings plus a business that generates you meaningful income, having a low seven-figure payday doesn't actually change your positioning that much. It doesn't open up opportunities in a way that I thought it would. Hmm. And when I pulled back and started to ask this question of people who've been through this before, I found that actually my experience was very common and that I could have known about this beforehand and that's why i think these questions are important so um the the next level from a financial platform or maximum lifestyle essentially if you've got like a couple hundred thousand in the bank and a a successful business you're not really like locked out of anything except yachts right like what do you (laughs) really need right right the question is like, what's that level that it's worth giving up everything for? And the level that I borrowed from, it's a term I borrowed from Jason Cohn. It's called the freedom line. And the freedom line is, is basically what people typically call your number. It's that number at which you can kind of shelve financial questions for a lifetime. And that's the opportunity that we all have with a business is that you could potentially get to that level where, you know, you're wealthy in a way that is bigger than just your consumables or basic retirement savings that Mm -hmm. you can actually take care of your family. You can invest in young entrepreneurs. You can do all these sorts of things that you can't quite do at where we exited for, you know, I'm still back to work, man, you know? And so that's, um, and again, it's going to be different based on your values and your goals. And so I think that's that exercise would have been invaluable because Although some might say, hey, Dan, why are you complaining? You got a good deal for your business. You got lucky. Well, all that's true. But I didn't really get a good deal for me personally based on my personal goals. Mm. Um, And that's because I didn't have them in mind 
when I made this transaction. Did you think, think that that amount that you guys were selling out for would put you in a would, would have you in a better position than what it turned out to be? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I didn't. I just didn't think about it in detail. Mm-hmm. Which. You know, it may be easy for people to dismiss and say, well, Dan's just an airhead or he wasn't engaged <laughs> or he was out for lunch. And I think all those things are honestly partially true. It just wasn't a pressing question for me at the time, which in retrospect is is really dumb because that was the question. I was thinking more emotionally like, hey, you know, this business, it's, it's you know, honestly, it's causing us a lot of problems. You know, me and Ian are bickering about it. Um, it's... We've got a lot of staff. We've got a lot of risk. Um, we've got a lot of anxiety. You know, every business owner can relate to these things. We've got competitors. Why don't we just, you know, take the money off the table? It's going to be great, man. And it just, it sort of felt like this panacea. Like, it, uh, I think panacea means like a just a solution that solves everything. If it does, that's what I'm trying to talk about. Like it's like a, <laughs> it's just going to come in and take away all those problems. But it didn't take away any of those problems, and in fact, it introduced a few new ones. Mm. So, so yeah, that's one of the thought experiments, Chris. That I just think it would have really shaped. And now we still might have sold, but it really would have uh, had us engaged in a in a deeper way in the process of selling. What is your number? Right, so the so the the answer that <laughs> seven point five million that's the answer. How come? So seven point five million is the next level on my lifestyle ladder because that is the amount of money that I can simply be entrepreneurial and I don't need to be an entrepreneur anymore, right? Like that's the, <laughs> that's the level at which I can go around and get involved in projects that may or may not be profitable um, and still take care of my lifetime family and financial goals. Mm. And how you get to that number isn't a serious inquiry in my life right now because I don't have a plan to get there. And I am probably not the best person to like talk about that strategy. It, again, it's like I say in the book, I don't know what I'm talking about here. Like I've exited one business. All I'm saying is make sure you're seriously engaging in these questions. And so you're doing the right thing. You're asking the right question, but probably of the wrong person. Um, I don't know how to be an investor, Chris. I don't, I know that I, I don't know how to do these things that well. I'm still sketching together that idea myself. But my sense is um, uh, 7.5 million. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to give you a scenario here, and it's a true one because I have a number. And, I, I, and I'm curious about your feedback on it. I made a goal to have a uh, million dollars in the bank account or within assets in 11 years. No, excuse me, not a million, 11 million in 11 years. And I got that number because <clears throat> I thought, well, if you have around 10 million and then you put it in just typical investments around 10% interest, then you'd have about a million dollars a year to live off of. And that's more than enough to be comfortable without a doubt. And you could, you know, kind of do whatever you want and protect everything and have some for, more fun investments and take care of your family and that sort of thing. What's your thoughts on that? Um, I would say that that's, uh, I don't have, there's no red flags that come out to me about that. I mean, the typical investment path is probably the most common way to think about this, which is like, you know, that five to 10% return on your, your principal cash that you can then live off of and not, not bite into, um, the main chunk of it. I, I don't have a problem with that. In fact, I mentioned it in the book that $10 million for Westerners is a very commonly suggested <laughs> number or freedom line. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It goes 100,000. Go ahead. A few, few quotes about it in the book. Yeah, well, that's the interesting thing then because the, the implication, Chris, is then that like for a lot of people, this sort of multi-hundred thousand dollars jumps to like multi-millions mm-hmm. that essentially having a quarter million dollars in a business 
is the same thing for most people as having two or three million bucks. Hmm. And so it may not be. So there are people who have the ability to say, say you live in a market where there's lots of uh, real estate that you can get into for $75,000 a single family home and you feel like you can flip it to 140 grand or whatever and you're good at that and you know the market. All of a sudden, having 3.5 million might be enough leverage for you to get into that market and make your money work for you. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think in the tech space or the entrepreneurship traditional space, like online entrepreneurship, we think more in terms of like startups and angel investing and stuff. And like that technique tends to push your numbers a little bit higher because if you have, you know, a, a home and maybe your family home and then investments and retirement and your kids are going to college and you have 2.5 million, you're probably not going to r- want to write like $25,000 burner angel checks. Right. Particularly, particularly if you don't have a source of income. Remember the first one that you built took you five years. Right. And you did it when you were 25. So now all of a sudden you're 35, you're 45, you're 55 and you're signing yourself up to do it again. And that's one of the thought experiments we go through in the book is remember how hard this was. <laughs> remember how hard you worked. Do you want to do it again at this stage in your life? So yeah, the punchline, Chris, is that there's this thing I call maximum lifestyle in the book, which is sort of like your top end consumable lifestyle. For a lot of us, that's like making 100 grand a year, a couple hundred grand a year. Like There's pretty much not a lot that you're like, man, I wish I had... 400 grand a year it's like come on how much stuff can you buy um ideally you're saving a lot of that money and you're living much more frugally um but there because that's the fact for so many of us um that jump up to the freedom line tends to be a lot bigger than um you might think when someone's sort of waving a million dollars in front of you um so that's the uh, purpose of the first thought experiment just to figure out what that means for you. And by the way, there are people that have a much lower number. People might think, oh, you know, Chris and Dan with their, who the hell do they think they are? Well, fair enough. <laughs> if we cared, we wouldn't be entrepreneurs, right? right. If we cared, we'd have jobs. So uh, that number for you, dear listener, might be half a million. If, if, you're, uh, if your lifestyle is much different, if you don't have a lot of dependents, if you're in love with a part of a country that is extremely affordable and you want to do homesteading, or if you want to live a frugal lifestyle, whatever, like it might, it might very well be very small. One thing that I've really become conscious of over, I don't know, maybe the past six months or so is my, this thought or programming in my mind that keeps telling me more, 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 more. So like you were thinking, you guys were thinking, uh, more money would solve more of your problems. So let's sell the business and then see what happens next. Cause we'll have a bunch of cash in the bank account. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious, like, what would you say to those entrepreneurs that are out, that are out there, you know, that are hustling, that are trying to hit, you know, that six figure, seven figure level. And then they want to hit that big exit kind of like you guys did and they're always going after that that drive that's created in us for whatever reason society or parents or whomever or movies or whatever uh, what would you say to those people for that insatiable desire to have more more money more assets more of everything well i think so this is uh the fifth thought, thought experiment in the book that touches on this. Um, so let's just flip ahead to it. Just want to make sure I'm. You know, I didn't. I'm. I'm glad I'm asking these questions because I have read the book. Which shame on me. And shame on you. Yes, and also, um, I'm. You didn't set me up for these questions, so it's working out perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, Chris. Thought you don't have to read the book after listening to this. No, that's no, the good news. No, you should. So read it. you should read it. Listeners, simple. read it. Go buy it and read it. <laughs> so here, here it is. Thought experiment number five. Is it possible that you're ever so slightly deceiving yourself? Are there painful truths that you don't want to admit? And here's here's a here's one of these ideas that. Um, 
you might be incompetent at taking your business to an actual next level. And so a payday might be an easy way to get yourself out of the bind of the, the true difficulties that improving a business um, might require you to undertake. So in other words, like selling can often be an easy way out when you're sort of stalled out. Like one of the reasons we gave for selling our business was we felt bored by it because we had learned everything we thought there was to know <laughs> about that business, which obviously, yeah, you're laughing because it's such an obvious blind spot that we had. We thought we were just expert at this. We thought we were so good. We knew how long it was going to take to get it to 10 million. We knew how long it was going to take. Um, in retrospect, there are so many things we could have done to build a better business, one that had a stronger team, that people were more engaged in the culture, one that had better products and more exciting initiatives. Um, often, this more, more, more is a cheap substitute for the things that we and people around us really want in life. You know, one of the things that you'll find amongst a lot of people that have had financial success is that they're pretty bummed out that they can't purchase the things that really matter. Like you can't buy respect. You can't buy time with your family. You can't buy a business that engages your best energy. Like Those are really hard things to sort out. And that's the task that we all have in front of us. And just making more money isn't going to do it. And that's why people go off the deep end often when they do, because you do this, you go through this whole existential cycle and you realize that you sold out quite literally while not taking a look at the things that were really important at the core of what you were building. Does that make sense? Yeah. How do you see those things that are more important now that you've been through that transition? Well, probably the same way. I mean, that they're hard. Like good things are hard. Like earning the respect of your peers is hard. Keeping your word is hard. Managing a team is hard. All these things that that uh, um, bring value to your life are actually quite difficult engagements. They often can be. So there's this fantasy that many of us have. Oh, now our first thought experiment. We figured out that we want ten million bucks. Well, what's going to happen? When we get 10 million bucks, well, we're going to make all the appropriate investments. And then many of us are going to post up on some resort island and feel really lonely because now all of a sudden everybody thinks we're this really successful person and we've sold out of every kind of engagement and tribe and community that we <laughs> previously had and the sense of service that we got for doing good work for our customers and for the staff that depended on us. And now we're sitting on the remote island supposedly living the dream. And it doesn't feel that great. Hmm. So now you, you start saying, well, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to invest in people. But I don't want to manage people, but I don't want to do too much work. And so you start to do that and feel the same sort of emptiness. Because you're not willing to go through any kind of struggle with others. Which is where all the stuff that's good exists and all the values that you can't buy exist. So... Look, you know, making a living, this is a, comes back full circle, making a living, you know, the, the line between like entrepreneurship and like life guru is so close and blurred, um, which to me is a kind of bummer. Like, you know, living a good life is a, a question that's so much bigger than growing a good business. And uh, we can tend to conflate them. Right, so like if I'm successful and I exit and I make the freedom line or whatever, that like I'm gonna be happy with life, I'm gonna be good at life, I'm gonna be engaged with my life, and it's just not true. It's a it's a harder question to answer the life stuff. How, how do you think you're better at life, or what are some ways that you try to be better at life now that it's post the exit for you? I'm not so sure that I am any better, Chris, to be honest with you. I don't know. You are. You are. I know you. Uh, you are. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I was, I was pretty bummed out about it, and I wasn't really sure why. And so just sort of formulating these questions and getting this conversation that we're having started was my way of uh, just sorting through it all. 
and talking to so many people who've been through this entrepreneurial life cycle, um, that was how I responded to it. Um, and it's ultimately by being honest with myself and with others about it, it's allowed me to have better relationships with the people that I work with. Um, and that's probably been the main thing. That's beautiful, man. I, I had a bunch of other stuff to talk about, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we talked about the exit and the exit's awesome. This, the book we can find on Amazon, right? Before the exit thought experiments for entrepreneurs. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Anything else that people should check out, Dan? Actually, I want to I, I want to plug the DC if you don't mind. It's cool with you. Sure. All right, you guys, the entrepreneur. Excuse me. Dan is the founder, co-founder of an organization called the Dynamite Circle, which I'm a member of, and I think it's a fantastic place for location independent entrepreneurs to to go and check out. You can find it at the dynamitecircle.com. Dan has an amazing podcast where he interviews some quite incredible people and Seth Godin being one of them that he just interviewed recently, which uh, was an amazing show, man. I listened to it twice. No kidding. Listen to it twice. <laughs> it was so good. And I took notes. Here. Yeah. So any, any new awesome guests you have for the podcast coming up that you can share with us? Uh, no, <laughs> I've peaked with Seth. There's no, there's no beating that, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard to beat Seth for sure. So it's just going to be little old me going forward, and then uh, hopefully we can get some uh, exciting guests in the coming months. I, you know, honestly, I'm pretty excited to do uh, a little bit more potting myself lately, um, because we're starting a new business called Dynamite Jobs. And Dynamite Jobs is essentially, it's a job board, but it's also a service that helps build remote teams. So it's, you know, as this location independent thing goes more mainstream, there's a lot more professionals that want to join the community and they have a professional skill set. So instead, you know, five years ago, Chris, we were just talking about virtual assistants all day long and Upwork and stuff like that. Now what we're talking about is like that professional who migrated away from their hometown to live in a big city, to work at a big job and realize that they're not saving any money. They're working all the time and they prefer to be back in their hometown, particularly if they want to have a family. But they have this incredible professional skill set and they want to contribute to your business. So... It's a site that helps entrepreneurs hook up with professionals to grow distributed and location independent teams. So in other words, like I'm kind of back on the business building bandwagon and I have a lot to share. So it's kind of cool. Like I wrote this book and I was like, you know, I don't know, trying to cope emotionally with this. I thought this was going to be so great and it wasn't as great as I thought I was going to be. And so, boom, here's the book. And now I'm back to square one, man. I feel like a little bit reborn, you know? It's like, hey, man, there's a lot of awesome stuff to do in this community, and I'm excited to do it. And one of those things is, uh, one of the hardest things and most important things is growing teams. So we're working on solving that problem. I've got to ask you, who, other than Seth Godin, who's your dream podcast interview? I guess right now I'm trying to get uh, Nassim Talib on the show. Um I think he's kind of a hard get, but uh, I take his ideas very seriously. I've read all his books, and uh, I think he's one of the few people publishing today, you know, in this space that will be read 50 years from now. I have to admit, I have no idea who that is. Can you share some more about him? Yeah, so his breakthrough idea that got him famous was called The Black Swan. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, he wrote a book called Full by Randomness, Anti-Fragile, and his new book's called Skin in the Game. Gotcha, gotcha. What else, Dan? Any other uh, stuff that you want to share? No, I think, you know, uh, I've been doing the Tropical MBA every Thursday morning since 2009. That's my main gig. That's where you can hear about everything that's going on. Yeah. What's the... Oh, we talked a lot about, about a lot of fun stuff today. Amish people, <laughs> your exits... <laughs> Podcast guest. I think we made a good show. For the listeners to decide. You never know. <laughs> uh, I'll let you know how it turns out, man. Thanks for coming on cool. the show, Dan. We really appreciate it. As always, I love your vision and I love your friendship and I love everything that you do for entrepreneurs in the world. So thanks so much, my friend. 
My pleasure, Chris. See you this summer in Europe, I hope. Yeah, for sure. And listeners, thank you guys for joining us once again, and we'll see you all on the next episode. Goodbye, everybody. Hey, listeners, thanks again for joining the show. We wanted to remind you about our Get Shit Done one-on-one productivity coaching that we recently just launched. What we do is work with you to create big business goals that are absolutely game changers. We make a plan together and put you in our productivity hacking system that helps you stay on target. Each week, you get a call with yours truly about what steps to take for the following week. Some say it's like a year of productivity in just three months. Check out all the details at thebusinessmethod.com forward slash coaching. Thebusinessmethod.com forward slash coaching.